Hi, everyone. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live streaming EKU Chautauqua presentation, sponsored by Eastern Kentucky University's nationally prominent honors program and housed in the College of Letters, Arts and Social Sciences. My name is Eric Liddell, Chautauqua Lecture Series Coordinator, and I am delighted to be joined tonight by Dr. Talithia Williams of Harvey Mudd College and a scientist who has worked with both NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, among other places. Thank you for being here, Dr. Williams. To, uh, absolutely. To give a combined Women's History Month and Celebration of Science and Mathematics keynote presentation. Ordinarily, our College of Science hosts a full week of activities devoted to the celebration of math and science, including this keynote, and of course, we all look forward to the return of these events to campus next academic year. And in that connection, uh, joining us tonight for Q&A and discussion at the conclusion of Talithia's presentation, I want to welcome the Dean of our College of Science. You see him there uh, posed in front of a picture of our uh, science building, Dr. Tom Otieno. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Uh, as, alongside Dr. Lisa Kay, Professor of Mathematics and Statistics here at EKU. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, thank you. And yeah, and uh, we are expecting another Dr. Lisa, Dr. Lisa Day, who is the head of our Women and Gender Studies program to join us a little later as well. Um, I, we apologize in advance if she pops into the screen and we have to admit her. Uh, perhaps she'll be joining us just at the conclusion of the program. So in just a moment, I will hand the screen over to Talithia and the rest of us will return at the conclusion of her remarks. And viewers out there, I see uh, many of you are already saying hi and hello and uh, welcome again to you all. Um, everyone out there uh, is uh, encouraged to submit comments and questions right there uh, in the uh, YouTube chat. Uh, you can also do it uh, on Twitter, if you wish, at EKU Chautauqua. And I'll remind you later on in the presentation to get some questions and comments in for Talithia Williams. And she's let me know in advance that there are a couple of moments which are kind of uh, interactive with you out there. So uh, she might have some questions or whatever, survey or multiple choice for you. Go ahead and put your comments and answers in the, in the chat. That way I can share them with her later. Um, full details of our remaining Chautauqua spring schedule are on our website and you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter for updates and reminders. Without further ado then, Talithia Williams is professor of mathematics and statistics at Harvey Mudd College in Claremont, California and the author of the critically praised book, Power in Numbers, Rebel Women of Mathematics, the subject of her talk tonight. She received her bachelor of science in mathematics from Spelman College before earning two master's degrees the first in mathematics from Howard University, and then another in statistics from Rice, and finally a PhD in statistics also from Rice University. In addition to her teaching, her professional experience includes research, research appointments at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the National Security Agency, and NASA. And in 2018, she was the host of the cutting edge six part PBS series, Nova Wonders, which I happen to have been watching over the past week uh, at night, and I highly recommend to everybody. You can find links to her book and to that series on our webpage. And so it's my pleasure to welcome you to Lithia Williams to EKU Chautauqua. And uh, with that, the screen is yours, and we'll awesome. see you back in a bit. Perfect, perfect. Well, I'm so excited to be here, Eric. Thank you for that warm introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you and share the presentation so we can jump right into it. Um, I'm also in the chat. So for those of you in the chat, I can see your comments. So if you wanna make comments throughout or if I invite you in, please feel free to respond and know that I am looking at myself as I'm looking at you uh, during the talk. <clears throat> so uh, as Eric mentioned, um, I've had the privilege recently of partnering with PBS and with Nova to co-host a six part series called Nova Wonders. And this was really sort of stepping out of my comfort zone, you know, as a math and statistics professor, because I got to get into these, you know, big questions of science and really talk about how data shows up in these different areas. 
So we did episodes like what's living in you? Uh, can we build a brain? What's the universe made of? So really sort of exciting topics that are at the cutting edge of science. Throughout this process, uh, I was definitely stretched in ways that I never thought I would have been, you know, uh, having to sort of be in a studio and, you know, uh, thinking through what it means to really communicate science in a way that's exciting uh, and compelling. So I want to show you a, a clip from our series. Inside a human brain, there's about a hundred billion neurons. And each one of them can connect to 10,000 others. And from these connections comes everything. <laughs> the human brain can compose symphonies, <laughs> create beautiful works of art. It allows us to navigate our world, to probe the universe, and to invent technology that can do amazing things. Now, some of that technology is aimed at replicating the brain that created it, artificial intelligence, or AI. But has it even come close to what these babies can do? For ages, computers have done impressive stuff. They crack codes, master chess, operate spacecraft. But in the last few years, something has changed. Suddenly, computers are doing things that can seem much more human. Today, computers can see, understand speech, even write poetry. How is all this possible? And how far will it go? Could we actually build a machine that's as smart as us? One that can imagine, create, even learn on its own? How would a machine like that change society? How would it change us? I'm Rana El Kalyubi. I'm Andre Fenton. I'm Talithia Williams. And in this episode, Nova wonders, can we build a brain? And if we could, should we? Yay, Nova wonders. So um, for the students in the space, I, I always love to start by sharing how I got here because it's easy to sort of look at someone's accolades and think like, oh, they're so amazing. Um, but you never see, you know, awkward pictures of them when they were in junior high school. So here you go, awkward junior high picture. Uh, but I share this to say that even as a as a eighth grader, um, I wasn't necessarily a math nerd or a math guru. Um, I liked being on the dance team. I played in the band, you know, I did, I did very sort of regular um, things. Once I got to high school, I got a job at the end of my 10th grade year as a grocery store cashier clerk. And this is back when most people paid with either cash or a check. And I remember in, you know, the, the hours that I'd spend ringing people up, I would always try to calculate their change before punching it into the cash register. And I know that sounds very simple, but it was a way for me to start doing mental math and get very fluent with just, you know, manipulating numbers, adding, subtracting numbers in my head. And it really prepared me and gave me a really solid mathematical foundation of doing that basic arithmetic all the time in my role as a cashier. My senior year in high school, I took AP Calculus. This is when AP classes were first coming up, right? And so it was just um, all these, all these were new and, uh, the students at my high school were like, yeah, let's take this AP thing. Like how hard can it be? Uh, well, it was, it was pretty hard. Um, <laughs> but I remember one of my professors, uh, Mr. Dorman, uh, he pulled me to the side after class and he said, you know, Talithia, you're really talented in math. You should think about majoring in it when you go to college. And I thought, well, my goodness, here's this old white guy. I think he was in his late fifties at the time, but to a 17 year old, he seemed old, but I realize now he was a young man um, who really spoke into my mathematical ability. He really affirmed my mathematical ability and said, not if you go to college, but when you go, you should major in mathematics. And let me tell you, I was not a star student in his class. I was, I was average at best. Um, come to find out, he said that to every student. He'd pull them to the side and be like, you too can major in math. Um, so he was just that type of encourager, but that really stuck with me when I actually did go off to college and it made me think about mathematics, like, oh, Mr. Dorman said I could do it, maybe I can do it. 
it wasn't until I got to Spelman for undergraduate that um, I met Black women who had PhDs in math. So all of a sudden, his words of encouragement really kind of became a reality for me. Here I am pictured with the late uh, Dr. Etta Faulkner. And she was one of my mentors who really encouraged me to go on to graduate school. I thought, I'm going to get this four-year degree, and I'm going to move on and you know get a job. And, and she said, have you thought about getting a PhD? And I'm like, well, what would I do with that? What is that? Um, and so she really helped me navigate going on to Howard and getting a master's and then eventually ending up at Rice for my PhD in statistics. I spent three summers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory out here in California, actually not far from me in Pasadena. And it was at JPL that I was really mentored by these two people. I got to work in uh, Dr. Lonnie Lane's lab and Claudia was one of my mentors there. And again, this was really sort of reaffirming where I could see myself in society, right? I mean, both of them uh, with their PhDs and just being able to work so closely with them on different research projects was really fascinating for me and really sort of um, compelled me to think about graduate school even more so. I love this slide because this was the day I finally finished my PhD. Notice we have a, had a little bitty baby in tow there, our two week old. Uh, Josiah was born uh, two weeks before graduation. And as, as Eric mentioned, you know, I'm a, a mom and have these three amazing boys that hopefully won't run in uh, during our chat today. Um, but, I, you know, I, I enjoy being a very well-rounded person as well. So, you know, there's some, these other facets of my life um, that show up. And then these are my colleagues. I'm in the math department here at Harvey Mudd College. Harvey Mudd's one of the Claremont Colleges out in Southern California, and it is a math, science, and engineering institution. And this is our, our Zoom photo uh, from this year's um, uh, department retreat. All right, so let's jump right in. Uh, hopefully you've got the chat up because I want to hear from you. Who is this woman? Don't Google it. You should hopefully know. But who is this woman? Who is she? Let me hear what you think. There's a slight delay, so you're probably hearing this now, and I'll hopefully start seeing who you put in the chat. Who is this woman? And what is she known for? Any guesses? Dawson, yes, Rosa Parks. Absolutely, right? We recognize Rosa Parks as one of the pioneers of the civil rights movement. Um, because of her, you know, uh, work in helping to really end discrimination on buses in Montgomery, uh, we honor her with stamps. We see, you know, her legacy has been widely recognized. Yes, Savannah, thank you. Okay, next up, I want you to tell me who is this young girl? Anybody know who she is? Who is this young girl? I'll give you a chance to think about it and put a guess in the chat. Just guess. No, there are no wrong. I mean, there are wrong answers, but don't, you know, just, just put your guess in the chat. Let's see what you come up with. Who is this young girl? Ruby Bridges, question mark. All right, that's a great guess, Lauren. Other guesses out there. Who is this young girl? All right, ready for me to show you? Claudette Colvin. Claudette Colvin uh, also refused to give up her seat on a bus nine months before Rosa Parks. So why is it that we don't know about Claudette and her contribution to the civil rights movement? Um, in fact, she was one of the plaintiffs whose case went before the Supreme Court that actually ended up overturning the 
the um, segregation policy in Montgomery. But we don't hear about her. And in some ways, she was a hidden figure. She came before Rosa Parks, really kind of helped to set the stage for what Rosa Parks did. Uh, but her, her work is unknown to us. Um, I don't know how many of you saw the movie Hidden Figures. You can put a thumbs up in the chat if you saw Hidden Figures. It is perhaps one of my favorite movies because as I shared with you, I spent summers working at NASA as a mathematician and this movie came out and I thought, oh my gosh, other black women have worked at NASA, you know, as, as human computers, as mathematicians. Um, so this book written by Margot Lee Shutterly uh, chronicles the lives of African-American women and women in general who really helped as the United States was sort of in this space race like against Russia to try to be the first to put a man on the moon. Um, here's one of my favorite clips from the movie. Let me share it with you. So we have the vehicle speed, the launch window, and for argument's sake. <laughs> yeah! Um, again, I love that movie. Um, but what does this have to do with anything that we're dealing with today? Why does any of this really matter today, right here and now? Well, the reason is this, I really think that big data, when we think about big data and how it is currently sort of revolutionizing society, it really is the 21st century's version of space race. Um, you know, when we were engaged in the space race, it was all about getting all hands on deck, all genders on deck, all ethnicities on deck, because we were coming together to compete and to be strong. And within strength, we needed that diversity. We needed diversity of thought, diversity of input. We needed the best ideas from, from all walks of life and all groups of people. And I think it really shows how as a country, we were able to come together and do that. And I think when I think about ways that big data is shaping our life today, we also need all of those minds, all of that brain power, um, all of that diversity at the table. And here's why. Think about the ways that you interact with data on a regular basis, on a weekly, daily, hourly basis. For example, your music, the type of music that we listen to. Uh, if you've got Spotify or Pandora, you know, it's really become very personalized to what you like and what you don't like. And so these music streaming uh, services are now crowdsourcing our feedback to algorithmically curate a playlist for each individual user. So it's not just my likes and dislikes that goes into it, it's other folks who liked music that's similar to mine. And then Spotify will say, hey, you know, we think you might also like this song that we've noticed that folks who like music that you like also like, right? So it shows up in what we listen to. It also shows up in what we watch. I don't know how many of you have Netflix or some other streaming video service, but as we browse through Netflix, you know, it gives you a rating for each movie it's telling you how likely it thinks that you will enjoy watching that movie. Okay? Based on your previous history, based on what you watched, based on what you started and stopped. Oh, you started this series and didn't quite get through it. So we're not gonna rank series like that as high. It also uses our data to try to predict shows that would appeal to a mass audience. So based on the types of shows that customers have liked, it'll create a new show that hits those different genres. So data influences what we see on television. It also influences how we move around in society. How many of you have the Waze app? Um, I, you know, I get around with Waze, especially here in, in Southern California in LA. And if you think about it, really Waze is tracking all of our cell phone locations, using that to try to determine what's the fastest route to your destination. Here's your, here, here's your estimated time of arrival. Here's possible traffic. So there's so many ways that data help us in our day-to-day -day life and really sort of help us very equitably. But there are ways that data is also, um, can also be a tool that perpetuates bias. This upper example, in this example, an algorithm was trained to identify if someone was blinking in a picture. This was an algorithm that was, um, used by a, a particular uh, uh, camera company. And so it trained it on a data set that showed opened eyes and eyes that were blinking. And so as you gave it data, it would, you know, when it would see similar eyes and photos, it would accurately determine if they were open or blinking. But what happened was that the algorithm got confused when it started to take pictures of Asian people because of the shape of their eyes. And so you see this picture in the bottom, um, <clears throat> 
in this example, a son had bought a camera for his mom. And he said, I thought it was broken because every time my mother took a picture, it kept saying, did someone blink? Did someone blink? Did someone blink? And what happened was that the algorithm had not been trained on data from Asians. And so it, it assumed that their eyes were always blinking in, in pictures. The bottom left corner there, you see a, a, pres a, a picture of former President Obama uh, that's blurred out and the algorithm is asked to identify it. And he gets identified as, as a white male. And so there are ways that algorithms inadvertently can perpetuate bias. Another example that you can think about is um, what happens when you when machine learning actually gets biased in terms of how it responds to questions like who's likely to commit another crime, right? That data tends to get analyzed in a way that suggests that certain groups are more likely even when they have similar situations. Or who sees ads for good housing or who's eligible for same day prime delivery, for example. These are all questions that ultimately get answered by a program, by an algorithm that has to take in data to determine that. And sometimes the data that it takes in is biased and can perpetuate the bias in its prediction. So then the question becomes, what do we do today? How do we solve these issues today? How can we take this vast amount of data, um, but also create a diverse group of people who can help solve the problems that we, uh, that are affecting society today and to use that data in a way that's very equitable. I think for me, um, when I think of the solution, it's really to think about how we can reach a broader audience of people. And I think for me, it starts right at home. Um, this is a picture of uh, my family a couple years ago. We, we, do, we do Christmas big, like we're like, yes, Christmas, let's celebrate, always exciting. But this particular Christmas, my father-in-law who had lived with us for a few years had just passed away. Um, that Thanksgiving. And so we, we wanted to get out of the house. Um, you know, it was a, sort of a sad time for our family. So we went to, to Georgia, which is where my mom is. And we spent Christmas with her. And so, you know, grandma has a simple Christmas. She just has a little tree, a couple gifts, you know, Santa can't leave a lot of gifts in Georgia because we got to take them back home. Um, so this was going great. You know, we're with family. We don't have to buy a whole lot of stuff because, you know, we're in Georgia. And uh, my oldest son, he comes in uh, the kitchen uh, while we're in Georgia and he says, mom, is Santa real? This is like the question that you, you know, you regret like, oh, my baby's asking me if Santa's real. So my response is, what do you think? <laughs> and he says, I kid you not, I think grownups eat the cookies and milk. I don't know. But how does he get to every kid's house in one night? I guess I believe 51, 52%. I kid you not. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, that's my boy. Like bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. That is my, my child. And I responded to him. I said, don't forget your margin of error. Son. Like, if, you know, has your mom not taught you anything? You can't just throw out a number without a confidence. No, I need a margin of error. So this was really exciting. So then I overhear him go to his, his younger brother who I think was like six at the time. And uh, he says, I have a way that we can figure out if Santa is real. And so I'm, 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 I'm eavesdropping. And he says, you know, if, if we have toys at home then that means that Santa stopped at our house too and left us toys. And that's how we'll know if, we're, if, if he's real. And if we don't have any toys at home then Santa must not be real. And so now all of a sudden my kids are like doing hypothesis testing. My six and eight year old are doing hypothesis testing, like coming up with a statistical experiment that they're gonna do to test and see if Santa is real. So, I mean, you know what I did. I called up the neighbor. I was like, here's how you can get into our house. Please go to, go to Walmart after Christmas, buy all the toys that are half off, <laughs> sneak in, put them under the tree. Um, I hope my kids don't watch this video until they grow up. And that's exactly what he did, right? So he goes in, you see my, my look of surprise. I'm like, oh yeah, who knew? Like the kids rush in, they're super excited. You know, wow, Santa came and visited us while we were away. But oh, why do I share that? Because, you know, it really does start at an early age of really getting kids, getting young people excited about math 
excited about data, excited about statistics, instead of hating it, right? If you know, how many people do you know when you ask them about math, or at least when I ask, and they're like, oh, I hate it. Oh, it's my worst subject. I'm just not a math person, okay? So part of it has to do with how we're raising the next generation to think about math in a way that's really exciting and inviting. Stepping outside of just sort of the, the family that I you know, get to influence on a regular basis, I really wanted to think about what can I do more broadly, especially for girls of color in STEM, because this is an area where women of color tend to be you know, very un underrepresented. And so about 10 years ago, I got to partner with a group uh, called Sacred Sisters, where we um, started an annual STEM conference of color uh, so STEM conference for girls of color. So bringing girls to our campus, giving them an opportunity to interact with women, scientists, engineers, you know, computer scientists, uh, mathematicians, and giving them a chance to see themselves, just like I was able to see myself through uh, Dr. Faulkner at Spelman and Claudia Alexander at JPL, see themselves in these positions, right? Seeing women that they can really identify with and look up to and, and model as a mentor. And then thinking even more broadly to how do we start to think about the next generation of girls? You know, like I said, when I grew up, I didn't know any other black women who were statisticians, who were mathematicians, who had PhDs. Um, and it wasn't until I got to Spelman that I, I met someone, you know, and, and I thought, well, I shouldn't be 19 years old before realizing that mathematics is a career pathway for me, that there are women who've come before me who've done it. Um, and that it's an option for me too. And so um, I, uh, I, I authored the book, Power in Numbers, The Rebel Women of Mathematics, to really share the story of the diversity of women that have come before us, that are kind of here present, and then up and coming women um, in the mathematical sciences and the work that they're doing. One of the women that features in the book, so these are just uh, uh, excerpts from pages in the book, uh, is, is Winifred Egerton uh, Merrill. She was the first American woman to get a PhD in mathematics and she got her PhD in Columbia. She had to petition the board of trustees to even to take classes in the PhD program. They wouldn't let her take classes with the other male students. So she got a copy of the syllabus and she got the book and she had to basically do an independent study of the material and then take the exam. So she wasn't allowed to do research or take classes with male students. And then after she completed all of her requirements for the PhD, successfully defended her dissertation, um, the institution was hesitant to be the first to award her, you know, the, the PhD. And so she again had to go and petition every board member uh, to give her the degree that she'd rightfully owned, uh, earned. Uh, this was a big deal. In fact, an article was published in the New York Times that, that talked about this event. This was in 1886 and highlighted her graduating from Columbia. Notice what the article says. It says, she was a modestly dressed uh, in a walking dress of dark brown stuff trimmed with velvet of the same material and wore a brown chip hat, which had a pompon of white lace and feathers. Never mind that she's the first American woman to get a PhD in math. Like here's this article that is really more focused on what she was wearing on the day that she got the degree. Other women whose work is highlighted in the book is Katherine Johnson, recently uh, the late Katherine Johnson. And you know, the, the work that she did working with NASA, um, breaking those color barriers, you know, really bringing her mathematical expertise to the table and using it in a way that really helped transform how we think about um, space, how we think about you know, um, uh, travel um, and, 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 and doing her job really well, right? Doing it with dignity and with honor and, and doing it well. One thing I love about the book is that it's not just talking about their mathematical accomplishments or achievements, but it's really presenting their life as a beautiful picture with these beautiful images that showcase these women. I also wanted to, to highlight some of the modern women who are up and coming. Uh, this is a great photo of Eugenia Chang. She was recently on the Stephen Colbert show talking about how to make pie and how math shows up in baking and cooking and, and um, how, how exciting it is. And to really sort of appeal to, the, to a, you know, a new generation 
of mathematicians and to, to young scholars. And I love this quote that she says. Um, she says, I, I wanna show everyone that math is fun and creative. It is not just about getting the right answer. It's about exploration and investigation. It's not about memorizing formula, uh, that it's not just about numbers and equations and that timetables, it's really not that important. So really sort of seeing that there's some, there's creativity, there's ingenuity and there's excitement that comes with math and data science and statistics. And it's not just all dry. Um, the, one of the, my mentors that I, I get really excited uh, to feature in the book is um, um, my, one of my professors from Spelman, Dr. Sylvia Bozeman. And um, I often love to highlight her as well because she, you know, really poured into me at a time when I didn't imagine myself uh, the way you see me now. So all these accolades and all this other stuff came because I had professors and, and Dr. Bozeman in particular, who really uh, poured into and affirmed my mathematical ability. And if anything, that's really what I want to leave with the next generation. You know, the reason that I love doing this conference and, and you know, writing this book and speaking is letting young people see the possibility, um, seeing that anything, not just that you can do math or you can do stats or you can be a data scientist, but really you can be and should be in all of these spaces and to really think about how we can invite everyone to that table. Thank you so much for your time today. And I'm excited to answer any questions that you have. So if you wanna drop some questions in the chat, I'd love to engage with you uh, and answer those questions as well. So thank you. Thank you very much to Lithia, Dr. Williams. <clears throat> and while we give uh, uh, people a, a moment to think of maybe of some comments and some questions, um, let me welcome my uh, colleagues, uh, Lisa Kay and Tom Otieno back to the Zoom room here. And I'll turn things over to them in a moment. But first, uh, thank you very much for that uh, really interesting uh, tour of a wide variety of interrelated uh, aspects, uh, you know, from the sort of hidden figures uh, from a historical perspective, you know, to some of the uh, um, uh, math and science female pioneers, right, connected to the movie that you'll see in the chat, uh, others have seen and agree is really great. Yes. Um, you know, to questions of data and big data in our uh, current century, I love the way you called it the 21st century space race. Um, so many ways in which that's, that's probably true. Yeah. For all of the stuff going on behind the scenes internationally, et cetera. Um, and I really appreciated uh, from my own perspective how you brought it home uh, regarding music streaming and Netflix. <laughs> I find it I find it both uh, kind of fascinating and alluring, like you know, seductive, but also a little bit um, uh, too much. You know that that the system can kind of guess where I want to go next. That's Although right. I do admit, you know, most of the time it's it really is something that I yeah. you know do like and would maybe have. Uh, not have noticed, right? Not have chosen if I had been left to my own devices rather than mm -hmm. have the AI do it for me. Um, so, you know, just from a personal perspective that really brought it home to me. And so uh, yeah. thank you for all of that. And of course, mentioning several of the figures from your book. And, um, you know, uh, while we give uh, the viewers out there another moment or two to maybe mm -hmm. uh, chime in with some comments and questions, let me invite uh, Lisa and or Tom perhaps to to share a comment or a question and to get involved. Um, so um, as a faculty member, of course, I'm always thinking about uh, you know, trying to get uh, students enthused about math and statistics. So um, do you have advice about how to uh, convince young people to consider um, a career in math or statistics? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think the first thing that I and we kind of struggle with is, is even getting them to think about taking more math courses, right? Before we even think about a career, like how can I just bring you in to take a couple more courses? But I recently sort of redesigned my courses to, to instead of having, you know, final exams and everything being so exam driven to being more project based. And I found that when I create projects that are very open-ended, that really 
allow students to ask and answer their own questions, to collect their own data or look for data that interests them. Um, they're much more engaged in the result and the analysis than if I just say, here's a data set that's clean and it's, you know, just a random data set, you know, show me that you can do all the techniques on it. And so I've really thought about ways to engage them. For larger institutions where you've got like a football team and a basketball team, um, uh, students have done projects where they monitor like, you know, let's look at what our football team eats during a week and how their performance is on games, right? So collecting data on, you know, time spent in the gym, you know, let's give them a vegan diet for the week and see if they have more energy at the game on Saturday. So these are all ways that that statistics can be used uh, in their day-to-day -day life. And I find that that's what ends up bringing students to want to know more because all of a sudden I've got this data that I'm interested in and now I need the tools to try to get information from it. Um, and so yeah, in addition to talking about how much you can make as a data scientist or a statistician, like that's the other part that helps draw people in. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, my comment is also related to that. You know, I liked, um, you know, your, your own story, um, how, you know, first of all, starting with the teacher who basically affirmed to you that, uh, yes. yes, you've got the ability yes. to go to college and do math, mm -hmm. um, you know, and all the people you work with, and also how you yourself have started doing that with your kids and, you know, um, seeing math in everything that they're doing and pointing out to them. Now, clearly not every um, child has that uh, sure, sure. background support. Uh, their parents are not uh, mathematicians. We have a lot of students here uh, who in fact are first generation kids. Mm -hmm. So they come to college, uh, great ambitions. You know, They want to be physicians, they want to be engineers, they want uh, all this stuff in STEM. And um, as Lisa kind of asked, you know, how do you get them engaged? But my question is, once they've reached college, mm -hmm. I see that some of them have almost literally given up that they can't do that. Um, is there something we can do um, beyond the engagement in the classroom? Because you know, there, a few of them will be taking the math classes, but are, are there other programs or things we can do with them outside classroom that can inspire them? And then, um, what can we as college professors do with say high schoolers and middle schoolers to help the gap that they may not be having from their own homes? Absolutely, that, that's a, such a great question. So for your first part, you know, what is it that we can do maybe with our own students to help get them to reach their goals? Um, I think first it's, it's affirmation. And so, you know, when I, when I think about, you know, my, my one personal data point, um, I'm serious when I say I, I was not necessarily the brightest or the smartest or the top student in any math class necessarily, but I always felt like my teachers affirmed me and encouraged me to stick it out, even when I might have failed a class. It's like, it's okay, Talithia, you're going to take this again and you're going to pass it and here's how I'm going to help you. Uh, most schools aren't set up that way. Most higher ed institutions are like, oh, that, well, that just means you're not a math person or you're not a STEM person or you should probably change your major. And so I, I think as professors, we really have to have the bandwidth to see through, to help students see, the, see their vision through, see their vision of themselves through, give them the resources they need to be successful, but then also hold them to their own success, right? I'm not gonna let you quit. I'm not gonna let you change your major you know, you can do this, we can do this together, or let me get you the resources to help you be successful. Instead of, oh, it's okay, we know we're gonna weed out half the students, that's just, it's the sciences, that's just how it is. It doesn't have to be how it is. So, so that, that is, is first, I think is key. And then also I think creating communities of students who are going through the process together. You know, the benefit of going to Spelman that I only realized in hindsight was being in a class with all these women, all these black women, you know, we're in this math class and there was no competition. It was, it was easy to find a study group. It was easy to just, you know, get help. Or if I failed an exam, like, you know, oh, I failed, what did I do on this? Right? Easy for my, for my Spelman sisters to really help and encourage and motivate me because I had that community. But I'm realizing in institutions that are much more diverse, 
you know, you might have one or two students of color that are a math major, for example, and then there's not that community to lean on and depend on. And so if you don't see yourself represented, then it's hard to sort of stick with it as you start to inevitably fail in certain things and it's as you're challenged. And also people see you differently in the field. You know, when I got to Rice as the only black woman, uh, the only black person in my cohort, it felt very different in that environment to be in a class as the only woman, the only black person. And then I'm in this room of all men. And so when I ask a question, folks are like, oh, yep, Olivia doesn't know. And it's like, no, I really just, you know, I have a question. And so, you know, how do I operate? How do you operate in these spaces where you're the only and who comes to build community with you? The second part of your question was sort of what happens at the, at the high school level when we have you know, um, gaps in learning and, and how do we sort of help that? You know, for me, thinking through this, this conference for girls was, was kind of my way of thinking about how to address that. Um, you know, the fact that we, we, we get students in who aren't necessarily prepared to step into a, a, a STEM major. I think at the college level, we have to give the resources for students to be successful. Because it's, it's easy to blame K through 12 and there's nothing we can really do about K through 12. And so I think we just have to build programming in that's gonna start students based on where they come and say, okay, well, maybe it's a five-year program, but in this five years, we're gonna get you through with this kind of degree. And so I think we just have to start to, to, to change that within our own institutions. We can't depend on, on K through 12 to fix itself. Thank you. Yeah. If you, yeah, if you have a follow up, go ahead. But we do have some questions coming through on the chat as well. And you can probably take a look at them along with me if you wish, Talithia. But uh, we'll start with uh, Lauren Wallace, who has a comment that's not unrelated to what you're talking about, although it's about more of the surrounding yeah. um, cultural attitudes and so on, and social attitudes towards, um, in this case, African American women and uh, technology. Yeah, so you see that? Yeah, she says, I, I did a project on Kimberly Bryant, who created Black Girls Code which is another awesome program. And I think yeah. she's talking to everybody else in the chat. You should all look into it. Yes, it's so, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for um, sharing it, And then she asks, and I tried to ask her for a little more specificity, but what age range is your program for? I think maybe she's asking about Nova Wonders. Oh, I think she probably means the girls program, I'm assuming. Okay. Um, I can answer both. So the yeah, girls ahead, program, yeah. we, we really target middle and oh. high school girls. Um, and one year we actually we did girls and boys. So we just, we don't have the bandwidth to do both. So that's, a, you know, nothing against guys. We want guys to be successful in STEM too. Um, but yeah, we, we target middle and high school girls and boys. And typically we've targeted, you know, Southern California within say a 50 mile radius of the Claremont colleges. This year will be virtual. So, you know, I'll share the in information on my Facebook. Technically anybody can, can join in since it'll be virtual this year. So that'll be really exciting. Noble Wonders is uh, also targeted at kind of assuming that people who watch it have like an elementary education, but it would also have an interest in STEM. So it's, it's presented in a way that's engaging, um, not meant to go over your head, but really meant to sort of invite you into that space visually, talk about science in a, in a way that's going to sort of excite and pull you in. So like my kids watch it and they stay glued to it and they're, you know, nine, 10 and 12. So yeah, Nova's for all ages. I agree. Yeah. And yeah, it's very uh, enthralling. And yet, you know, because of the material, it's all cutting edge. And so, you know, even if you're at the, whatever, the forefront of that game, you might learn, may or may not learn something new, but you'll be like, yeah, that's exactly the questions we are asking today. And, and uh, that's where the science is taking us in this or that area. So I encourage everybody to take a look at that. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, our next question is from Stephen McQueen. Just for fun, what is your favorite thing in math? Um, okay, I have to say it's the derivative. Only because my husband, who is uh, his degrees in applied math, he he gave me this line when he was like first trying to like you know talk to me, and um, he came up and he's like, "I wish I was your derivative," and I was like, "What?" And he was like, "Cause then I'd be tangent to your curves," and I was just like, oh, "Really." You had me, but yeah, so. <laughs> wow, <laughs> what I know. a line. Like, oh, oh. So yeah, and the rest is, is history, but yeah. Um, I get fascinated in thinking about the derivative and how it's what you sort of shift dimensions as you can continue to, to take derivatives uh, and, and because it was one of the first things that my husband said to me, so yeah. 
Great question. That's great. Uh, thank you, Stephen, <laughs> for that question. <laughs> um, next, uh, we got a question from Linda. Uh, what are your thoughts on addressing educational disparities in public schools? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think it has a lot to do with funding, honestly. You know, I think the way that we've set up the educational funding structure to be conditioned on housing prices is unfortunate because, you know, we know that there's sort of systemic, systemic racism that shows up in housing pricing and quality of housing and taxes, tax revenue that comes from different types of neighborhoods. And then that goes into fund and school funding. And so schools that are underfunded tend to have students that are underperforming, you know, teachers that are underpaid. And, and so it's, it's a system that I think needs to be set up differently. The funding structure just needs to not be dependent on, on, on taxes from, from housing prices. So, so that's sort of a, a bigger issue. I think once you see equity in funding, once you've got schools that get the same amount of funding, for students, I think you you see those resources, and you will you know we will see improvement. Um, but but we, we we don't have that right now as a society. Uh, the other thing that I that I see in terms of changes that can be made are really um, changes that start to uh, to address the entire individual and not not just their performance in the classroom. So let's just say you've got um, in a quote an inner city school. Um, you know, do you have programs that provide, you know, free breakfast and free lunch and free transportation, you know? And so how do we think about what it takes for an entire, for a student to be successful in life and not just in the classroom? I think sometimes we get so focused on performance and then you've got kids that come to school that haven't had breakfast and you're like, but I need you to know, why aren't you getting this? And it's like, cause I haven't had anything to eat yet, you know? And so I think there's some basic ways that we can start to address a child's needs completely so that we can start to see that performance in the classroom. Thank you. And, you know, as a kind of segue into the next question by Ron Smith, who I know posted another one as well, you know, perhaps this new administration with Dr. Jill Biden, who's, you know, an educator herself, and, you know, might uh, engage in some top-down federal pushes, in, you know, in these different areas, yeah. right, to even out the funding and to support the whole person and, and so on. Certainly, I, I think that I agree with you, that would be a wonderful thing that would go a long way to um, solving some of the systemic problems. Um, but you know, on, on that question of the Biden administration, do you yeah. anticipate a different attitude towards science generally in the Biden administration from the Trump administration? Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like at least just based on what I've heard and, and read, um, that they are really putting science at the forefront of, of their decision making, and 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 I you know I I I welcome that change quite frankly. I mean I, I think it's it's refreshing to especially as a data scientist um, to see an administration that is really focused on on the data because that tends to be kind of how I personally make decisions, and so I, I think it will be at the forefront. Um, but I think they're also sort of balancing that with also wanting to, you know, open back up and wanting to get us back up and running. And so I, I, I don't see it as a detriment. I really sort of see it as an aid in making uh, better decisions. Yeah. Thank you. And let me just point out that Lisa and Tom, you can jump in again anytime you wish. Yeah. Um, uh, we have, let me go to the other question from Ron Smith, which uh, yeah. again deals with uh, math and science education. Um, the U.S. lags behind many nations in math and science, he points out. What can be done to better prepare American students to compete internationally? Yeah, um, so I'm curious to hear how you think of competitions. So there's, there's um, the first ways to think of it just in sort of like math competitions. So this is how a lot of kids in the K through 12 system actually compete in international mathematics competitions, in which case we do, we do okay, but it's a select group of people that, that do okay. Um, and then it's also, I, I think for me, a matter of what excites students to want to do the mathematics. So often in some other countries, at least from, from Asian friends that I have, it was, it was almost like a force or a push, like you're gonna be good, you're gonna learn this until you do it well. And, and I, we don't do that in America, but in some ways we also don't really push and encourage our kids to study mathematics as a society math in particular is seen as, as seen as something that it's okay to be bad at, it's okay to not like and not enjoy because most of us don't. And I think that's just, that's not necessarily um, 
the mindset in other in other societies. And so I think we have to change that mindset by saying, this is fun, it's exciting. You don't have to do it for your profession, but you should be excited about it, right? And you can let other people know that you're excited about it and you're knowledgeable about it um, as well. And so I think we have to sort of change the way that we talk about math and that we that we interact with our kids about it, you know, instead of like, ah, oh, I never used it. Don't worry about it. You won't need it, which is which tends to be what my students hear sometimes from their parents. We really have to think about how we change that narrative. Um, but to get at your second point here, right, in terms of lagging behind other nations, you know, I, if, if I think about, um, you know, part of what got a lot of students in math and science back in the 80s and 90s was that there was funding for students to go into that area. So there were scholarships from NASA, from the government, and you could use it at these different institutions. And so I think we really need to think about how to support um, kids who want to go off to college and want to major in science and giving them, you know, maybe federal money to do that as an incentive. Uh, part of the reason I majored in math was because I had a, a NASA fellowship. And it was like, we'll give you the fellowship only if you major in these things, you know, and so when it did get hard, I was like, oh, I really want to leave and go over here. It's like, nope, because otherwise we have no money to pay for school. And so for me, that fellowship like helped me to stay in when I was struggling. And I wonder if as a country, we might think about how do we fund these areas where we really need people to really convince more of them to think about pursuing those. So great question. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's interesting. It just yeah. strikes me as you were talking about that, that, you know, with the end of the federal, uh, the NASA control of the space shuttle program and the shift to private uh, you know, corporations and enterprises taking over a lot of space exploration. I wonder, you know, if 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 there hasn't been, I don't think there has been, you know, uh, an equivalent influx of money, right, to support the development and growth of young people going into science and technology from Elon Musk, from, you know, uh, SpaceX and all of those different groups. They, are you aware, you know, are do they have these types of programs that are widely um, not that I'm not that I'm aware of. Sciences. Not that I'm aware of. If someone knows, you know, drop it in the chat. But I'm not aware of it. Um, and they were very, they were very prevalent during the time of the space race. It was just like all hands on deck. What do we need to do? Right? We were. Um, my institution, Harvey Mudd, was created at the height of that movement. It was like, nope, math, science, and engineers. That's what we need you to produce. And so that was, you know, part of part of our founding. And I think there hasn't been that same push uh, since that time. Let's see, um, we've got a two-part question from uh, Adam Ooh. White, okay? So it'll take yeah, a minute yeah. to read it. Um, uh, not, uh, not everybody's looking at the chat, so let me just read it out. Yeah. E equity efforts via legislation and rulemaking uh, are important, but also a public effort that is visible to everyone. Manipulation of perspective or news interest via big data may also be very helpful, but mostly takes place behind the scenes. Right, so he's getting at suspicion and skepticism here. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the ethical implications of letting people know why their data is shaped in a certain way? The ethical implications. Okay, Adam, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by when you say shaped in a certain way. Um, I will I'll share a little bit of sort of what I think about ethical implications in terms of data privacy um, and, and how that's, that's becoming an issue recently in, in society. Um, so things like 23andMe, I'm just thinking about ways where, where as consumers, we've given access, given our data to companies to use, and sometimes they, all, they don't always use that in a way that respects our privacy. So 23andMe or Ancestry.com or these other ways where you might get your, you know, DNA results analyzed. You know, what does it mean to opt in or opt out and who owns your data and, and who has a right to your data? I think recently one of those companies sold some of that data to a, a pharmaceutical company. And, you know, the users got none of that. You know, you paid to have it analyzed and, you know, they made money by selling your data. And so I think these are issues that we really have to think about how to have a conversation around what happens in terms of data privacy, or if you have an Alexa, you know, in your home, what gets listened to? Uh, you know, I mean, everything is getting listened to in order to hear, hey, Alexa, uh, or hey, Siri. 
but what else do you hear? You know, and, and at what point is an invasion of your privacy? What if you heard abuse happening? Should Alexa report that? You know, like this isn't a TV show. This, these are voices that we know that are familiar and I hear abuse, I hear this child being abused. Should it call the police on that? You know, I mean, that sort of gets into privacy issue, but it also gets into sometimes these are the only, you know, these AI bots are the only thing that hear when something bad is happening um, at, at a particular location. So I think, you know, these are issues that we really have to work around and think about legislation that's going to be fair and going to respect privacy, but also if it's a way that it can help someone who is hurt or being abused, how we might think about doing that as well. Uh, I'm not sure if you noticed it, but Adam just uh, posted oh. follow up. So he, he's kind of talking about what oh goes, yes algorithms. Oh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, you're right about that. I mean, um, Eric, you kind of hit on that with Netflix, right? They're showing you things that they think you're going to like based on what you've seen before. Facebook has done that too. I mean, recently, if you look at elections, right? If if all my friends are, are Democrats and they're posting all these articles that are about Biden, then that just tends to be what's in my feed. And so it's affirming um, my own view and really not showing me a, a diversity of views. And so, um, and in a way it almost becomes sort of polarizing, Adam, which I think is to your point is that sometimes, um, because this becomes our source of news and then all of a sudden our source of news, what we see is very objective has really been skewed by what are the folks closest to us believe and what they share tends to be what we see. Um, you know, on that point, just to follow up very quickly, I, I think there's a way in Facebook and for example, on Twitter to uh, either opt into having them curate, you know, your news and sports right, preferences right, or, or opt out or of ads, that. right. Or you can opt out of it. And uh, I've chosen at least recently to opt out of it because that forces me to, you know, it, right. it causes them to give me things that don't necessarily have any relationship to the things that I'm already looking at. And yeah. it, it, you know, I'm not going to say it expands my horizons, but it, 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 it doesn't just keep me in that silo. Right. So, you know, I, I know that doesn't get to all the ethics of the Absolutely. situation that Adam was w talking about, but there yeah. are ways you can, yeah. you can kind of respond, right. To kind of, respond to that uh, behind the scenes manipulation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that, Adam. I appreciate it. Okay. We, we've got one more question here from Lauren, and then we are you know, getting close to our time. Uh, if, if there are other viewers out there who have another question, go ahead and get that in quickly. Uh, but Lauren wants to know, uh, what effect does big data have on voter discrimination mm -hmm. and, and I guess voting practices in general? I don't know if this is something you've necessarily looked at. I haven't, yeah, Lauren, I, I haven't looked at it from, from that angle in terms of data and voter discrimination. Um, I mean, I mean, if I if if you look at some of the newest legislation that is coming out in, in some states where the election was contested, um, it, it does sort of you know make me think about um, are those policies in place to encourage more people to vote or to really discourage people to vote? And so um, you know, be, being from Georgia, I, I paid close attention to the to the Georgia results, and you know, I, there was there was a huge push to sort of get people out, get them to vote, um, and and so for me, I, you know, it's about equity. It's an, it, it's really about access. It's about how are we really encouraging everyone to exercise their right to vote, and and not making that a hurdle. Um, and um, but yeah, I haven't I haven't thought about sort of the connection to to big data and voting necessarily. You know, I, I know that, um, you know, one of the concerns that hopefully uh, big data will help to rectify going forward, you know, is the misuse, right, of social media to provide disinformation and to confuse people and bamboozle people or whatever. Yeah. And so, you know, there's, there are ways we've seen already, right, in which um, the big data companies, in any case, have shown that through certain types of monitoring, they can start to filter out um, misinformation, lies, or at least flag them. And so, you know, there are some positive effects of this. And so I, that's a, I guess maybe a caution that we shouldn't just say, oh, big data is all going one way or the other way. You know, it's a complex beast, uh, clearly. And, um, you know, they're, they're, it's here to stay. So we need to find ways to 
get big data, you know, to uh, uh, work on the side of civic responsibility and mm -hmm. education and not just, let's say, I don't wanna, you know, paint too broad a brush, but get us to buy more products or, you know, to go down a certain um, avenue that's in their particular fav, you know, interest. That's right. That's right. I mean, I, I definitely have, have appreciated um, the way that it's called us to accountability. Like when you think about, oh, I just posted this and oh, come to find out that was fake. I love that it's, it's now showing me that instead of perpetuating the story. Um, which maybe I didn't know at the time, but but it's, it's fact checking for me. And so I think you're right. Big data can be used in a way to really benefit society. But I think, it, you know, there are also ways that it's used to sort of perpetuate our own beliefs as well. Uh, there are a few more comments coming in from Lauren. So you might want to you might want to take a look at that while I just read for the audience Adam's follow up comment. I think that's really interesting that gerrymandering may be the original big data. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, looking mm -hmm. at uh, voting tens and demographics okay. and uh, yeah. reconfiguring the districts in order to get the result yeah. you want. That's right. You know, that's a, an earlier that's way of, of kind of forcing a result. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm just I'm just re reading. Yeah. We're, sorry out there, people. We're just taking a look at Lauren's comments yeah. about uh, looking into the election and disparities in voting access and, and this type of thing. Um, well, those are comments more so than questions. And so, you know, I think I'll take this opportunity uh, along with Lauren there at the end of the, the yeah. chat to thank you. Uh, I concur with that heartily. This has been an absolute uh, pleasure. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing, you know, your uh, expertise and your interest and your passion to bear on this material and, and joining us here on this Thursday night uh, for EKU Virtual Chautauqua. Uh, you know, I know on behalf of my colleagues, Tom and Lisa, you have an open invitation to come to EKU, to come to Kentucky, you know, if, uh, when we get back to normal and if the occasion uh, permits. <laughs> We'd love I would love here. that. I'd love to come and see you all in person. That would be so much fun. So, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I'll invite Tom and Lisa to, you know, chime in, uh, unmute themselves and say good night if they wish. But, and meanwhile, I will just point out to our viewers that we'll be back here in two weeks' time with one of EKU's own professors of psychology, Dr. Sarah Insera, uh, who will be talking about. Uh, her work on data and uh, cognition. Uh, so uh, come back for that. Uh, you, of course, you can find out full information on the EKU Chautauqua website and on Facebook and Twitter. And Adam and others are chiming in saying thank you on behalf of uh, themselves and their family. So uh, with that, uh, we bid everybody good night. Um, stay well and stay safe. And we'll see you next time here on EKU Virtual Chautauqua. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.